excited to dig in. We've got um, an amazing panel here that I would love to spend 30 minutes talking to each and every person, but we're going to have a really fast-paced, really spirited discussion about the challenges and the opportunities facing Texas. And I'm just going to dive right in. We're going to have this first question to all of you so that we get a chance to know you a little bit better. So each of you are involved in civic life in a different way. What comes to mind is the event or events that triggered your interest in civic life and public affairs. And let's start with you, Glenn. Well, you know, there's not really one necessarily event that triggered it for me. Uh, being involved in politics to some degree, government service is something that really I've always felt compelled to. And you always wonder, who are the people that represent you? What are the values that they represent? And so being able to have an impact in the process to make a difference in people's lives has always been kind of an opportunity that I wanted to be engaged in. Now, I never imagined when I went and voted in this last primary that I would have spent 20 years of my life involved in public service. But, you know, there's really nothing higher than helping people at a basic level and one that no one even knows why you did it, no one even knows that you did it, but the fact that you helped that person, that's really what makes it worthwhile. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for your public service. We appreciate it. And Martin? Yeah, for me, it was actually, it was a specific point in time. It was in the late 1980s, and out of college, I'd gone to New York and worked in investment banking. And uh, what I say is I was on the 10th story of a skyscraper there, and I wanted to be on the street level. And so I wanted to uh, figure out how I could take, make a career that made a difference for communities and for people and to be involved in that sort of a thing. And uh, decided that food retail would be a good place to do that. And very fortunately for me, I ended up at HEB. Uh, that's where it started. Thank you. And Evan, how about you? <coughs> Watergate. <laughs> uh, from a very early age, I realized that journalism's job was to search for the truth and tell people what we find and to hold people in power and institutions accountable. And as a young person, younger than I should have been to be paying attention to this stuff, I was absolutely fascinated by not just what happened in Washington during Watergate, but the process of journalism as the finders of the truth about what happened. And that just stuck with me over many, many years. Uh, you know, I, I, I believe that public service manifests itself in many ways. You can, like Glenn Hager, serve in office. Um, you can, like Sarah Jackson, give in your community you know, I think journalism has gotten a bad rap over the last number of years, and some of that we've brought on ourselves. But fundamentally, the job of journalism is to provide what I think is the ultimate public service, and that's to hold people in power accountable. And it was Watergate that first taught me that, and I've never forgotten it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so similar to what Evan said, uh, my defining moment that led me to the University of Missouri was actually watching the press coverage on the death of Princess Diana. Um, but that would then lead me towards a path of trying to change the world through journalism, which is what Evan was describing. But really, the path that led me down wanting to contribute to civic life and public affairs uh, was me being that girl. I was the Mesquite High School Skeeters Class of 2000 president. Uh, I was government day. I was, you know, uh, went on to college and be, I was chair of our associated students to the University of Missouri, which is our system level student lobbying group that lobbied in Jefferson City and also in uh, Washington DC on behalf of student issues. And so it was that passion for the ability to be able to advocate and change the world and uh, through those things that made me go into that life. And from that, I've learned the value of relationships, diverse perspectives and counsel to make good decisions and partnerships. And so I still, to Evan's point, that's why I'm still working hard as a community person today. Great. Thank you all, appreciate it. We're gonna um, have a question for you now, Glenn. So saving for college is a challenge for a lot of families. So tell us what you think about the future of funding education here in Texas. You know, Texas, we're blessed in a lot of ways in that Texas is growing at remarkable rates. You know, every morning when we wake up, there's another thousand people that call Texas home. And people want to move here for an economic opportunity. But that growth has put a lot of pressure on the state budget, whether that is our healthcare system, our transportation system. And so those pressures of what we've seen is you see certain things in the budget get squeezed. And one of those, unfortunately, really in the last several years has been 
higher education funding. And so really trying to right size that and reprioritize that because one of the things that Texas has working for it is that we are a much younger demographic than many other states and nations which gives businesses a reason that they want to come here for that economic opportunity for the future as employers and workforce. But we've got to make sure that we reprioritize some of those resources to make sure that really higher education is affordable. And that's the real issue that for so many, it has been priced out in part because the state, some other reasons, has not put as great an emphasis on it as some other parts of the budget. And so that needs to be a reprioritization to be able to make sure that most and all of our demographic have that economic opportunity. Absolutely, thank you. And Martin, I've got a question for you next. So during the pandemic, we've, um, we've had this phenomenon of the great resignation, people deciding to just willingly quit their jobs, and it seems a lot of them decide to also move to Texas. Uh, so what do you think about the future of work in Texas? You have such a huge workforce. It's, it's uh, our biggest challenge today is uh, finding folks uh, across the board, be that entry level positions, be it for software engineers, be it for leadership positions, uh, you name it. So for those of you who are students, you're coming into the market at a great, at a great time. Yes. And uh, you know, we'd love for you to join HEB, of course, so you can know, <laughs> catch up with me today. But the, um, you know, the question I think is, is this a long-term long issue or is it a short-term issue? And there's obviously a lot of COVID factors that have caused uh, folks to step out of the workforce and hopefully a lot of them come back into the workforce. But I suspect part of this is long-term because of the aging population that we have and the, you know, numerous other factors. And so then the question is, uh, what do we do about it? And uh, the thing we, we're uh, really reliant on is improving productivity of the workforce, which uh, to your point is dependent on education. Particularly uh, what we need is uh, we need math skills, we need uh, communication skills, we need digital skills, and these are very important to us. And so uh, the future of education, higher education, and uh, you know, all the way down to uh, pre-K matters a lot uh, for our future. And then uh, I think it, it requires a really thoughtful discussion about how do we make that happen to deliver not just what we need in the way of employees, but what the entire state needs. Mm -hmm. Thank you, appreciate that. Now, Sarah, this is a question for you. Uh, you're the first woman of color to lead the Texas Lyceum. I say it's high time. <laughs> you've, uh, you've noted the changing demographics in Texas, and I'd love to hear your take on, on those changing demographics and what it means for the state. Yeah, um, thank you for that, Linda, and thank you for the cheers. I appreciate that. <laughs> Um, it, you know, I, I'm from Dallas, and the other part of the diversity of, of my leadership for the Lyceum is I'm only the fourth president from Dallas since we were established in 1980. And that speaks to some of you who are here in the legislature, you probably know what that means as well. But I see the changing demographics, to her point, um, is the need to really build bridges in various communities. Um, I think what we're looking at in the years to come for Texas is, you know, the need to, well, we will probably see a lot more diverse political candidates. I think we'll also, as has already been mentioned, the need to really think about our basic infrastructure and our strategic infrastructure investments in communities. So yes, we need to care about healthcare systems, education systems, as much as we probably want to look at tech. In addition to that, also the need to sort of look inward um, at what we already see outward, which is the census numbers. So Texas, what we saw from the Texas, uh, from the census numbers is Texas has a lot more people of color than it did 100 years ago. And I think that means something to a lot of institutions like the Lyceum and like other groups and institutions in this great state. Um, our state is rich in tradition. We're rich in legacy. We're rich in our pride. And I love it. I'm a first generation Texan with parents who were born in Sierra Leone, West Africa. And if you've ever been there, I am blessed every day to be born in America and specifically in Dallas, Texas. But I think what we've got to do is build those relationships with each other. And that means letting people come inside your home, sitting down, having these kind of conversations to get to know people on a personal level and understand what are the needs of their, their communities and frankly, how we can all best play in the sandbox together. Because I think as we look at the years to come, the state will become way more diverse. And it's, it's no longer our spot, their spot. We really need to look at ways of building bridges <laughs> with each other and trying to really frankly make this state as great as it will be and continue to be in the future.
Evan, I'd like to ask you the same thing. I know you've thought about this a lot too, yeah. and it's a huge topic. So what do you think uh, are the implications of the demographic changes for us culturally and politically? Well, well, I like Sarah's answer a lot. I'm gonna focus more on geography than demography. I'm really obsessed with the way the population of Texas is going to grow over the 30 years to come and where it's going to grow specifically. Right now, the same census numbers that Sarah talked about will tell you that there are 29.1 million people in the state of Texas. The demographers are predicting that we could be at 54 million by 2050. Think about that. The population of Texas will come close to doubling between now and 2050. More than 90% of that growth is going to be in the 82 metropolitan counties of Texas. So we're, the whole question of whether we're a rural state or an urban state that's over, we're an urban state, and we're gonna become more urban over time. But there are still, as of today, three million people in rural Texas, which is more than the populations of 18 states. So while we're an urban state, we still have a ton of people in communities where they still need good quality public education. We had a rural healthcare crisis before the pandemic, it's worse now. The comptroller is now presiding over an expansion of the state's role, overdue, many people think, on access to broadband, which certainly during the pandemic, whether you're K through 12 or higher ed, or you're trying to get access to healthcare in a community without it, you need telemedicine, broadband was really legitimately an emergency yep. during the pandemic. Rural communities need significant investment alongside the big cities. I worry that as a state, famously, our brand is low tax, low service. As we go from 29.1 million to 54 million, I legitimately question whether we're gonna sufficiently invest in so social and physical infrastructure to undergird all that growth. Will we provide a foundation to get us to 54 million, or will we allow ourselves to be at risk of collapsing under our own weight? I think the demographic change question is the most important question, but right beneath it, is how the population growth and the geography of this state over the next 30 years intersect and what the implications are for a place we all love. And you brought up something that I wanted to ask Glenn. Mm -hmm. So Glenn, we, we definitely saw during the pandemic, it, it really revealed the digital divide, the haves and the have nots of, of people being able to access what they need to do their homework, to work, to have telehealth, all those things. And I know this is something you're working on. So can you tell us a little bit more about that and what you're thinking about it? Yeah, so you know, the legislature last legislative session really brought Texas finally into the 21st century of making us one of the majority of the states that has some type of broadband development office. And, and right now we're on a 12, 12 city tour in the 12 different economic regions on a listening tour really to learn about what's going on in these different communities. Some of the communities are actually using some of their federal money to map, to use resources, to try to figure out how they have that extra connectivity. And during the legislative debates, in part, several of the members said, well, you know, this is about the last mile. We're gonna connect those three million people in Texas that don't have quote unquote service. In part, that is what we're doing. But another part of that is you can live in areas where there is quote unquote service but you don't have very good service. <laughs> to use a word I'm not going to, I mean, there's like a four letter word, it's bad service, okay? <laughs> and so the reality is this is about two prongs. And so one, I have learned through the time that I've spent in this office as well as the legislature is that building partnerships is really hard work. The front end takes a lot of energy to bring people to the table, have the discussions, and come up with a plan upon which we're going to deploy the resources, which doesn't mean the state is going to deploy it. It means we're going to, to essentially put the money out with the private sector, deploy these resources. And it can't be one technology. Texas cannot pick one technology. It's going to take a multitude, but it's those partnerships that builds a stronger product in the end because Right now in state statute, there's a certain minimum upload and download. But the fact is, as soon as we have that, we're already out date. We're actually out date before because the speed is gonna have to continue and the state needs to continue to have a role. And I think, you know, as, as, as we've heard here, and you know, Evan, part of the discussion is as we grow, how do we have that infrastructure? the road infrastructure, the water infrastructure, all those critical components. Because I've made the point over and over when I had a debate on the Trib Fest a few years ago, it was really a moderation. Te compare Texas and California. 
And I said, you know, you can't compare Texas and California of today. You gotta compare Texas of today of California 20 years ago. And the point is where they were growing rapidly, what do we learn from the lessons and how do we build that? And so, you know, really the fact is internet access, that is the highway system yep. of this day and of this century. And so it's an exciting opportunity, but it's also, we're under a lot of bright spotlights. And so that's the reason, you know, myself and my core team were very front and center on this because it's a lot of money. But the fact is, I'm very convinced we're going to have to have a lot more money than the money we have to be able to do this right and make Texas that economically competitive, connected state that we really need to be. Thank you. Martin, I want to ask you about a, a really hot topic. Healthcare is always a hotly debated issue. Um, I want to ask you what, you what you think about the future of healthcare in Texas and what can businesses do? What role should they play in really making sure that Texans have great health care? I think the most important thing that we as a society in Texas uh, and in the country need to do is provide a great public education for every single child uh, that, uh, that we have. I think to enable that, we've got to fix health care. And so I think health care and fixing that is uh, the linchpin to fixing education and the numerous other problems we have. And the reason why is because that's where the money is going. Today, we spend 18% of our GDP on health care, whereas the uh, countries we compete against spend 10 to 12%. And if you add together health care spending, public education spending, and social services, Combined, all of the developed nations spend about the same amount as a percentage of their, of their domestic output. Yet the fact is, is we outspend on health care to the degree that uh, prohibits us from spending on public education and social services what we need to, which gives, puts us in this uh, vicious cycle. This is something we need to rectify. And so now what do we do about it? It's, it's a complicated picture. And your question is, what role can business play? And I think there's uh, two thoughts come to mind. I think for those of us who are in a position to do something, which we are at HEB, we need to do something. And so some of the things we're doing is we've established uh, primary care uh, practices. We've got, uh, we're building a registered dietitian network. And we're creating, hopefully, a food as medicine program. Uh, a couple of the pharmacies, all of which I think can make a difference if we do it right, and the jury's mm -hmm. out on how well that works. Uh, but then the uh, second, uh, second thing I'd say that all of us, <coughs> excuse me, all of us need to do is understand healthcare as deeply as we understand our own businesses, as deeply as we understand civic education, which is critical, and as deeply as we understand anything in our lives, because I think it matters that much to get this right. And uh, the only way we solve it is, uh, because it's such a complicated problem, is if all of us understand it at a, much at a much deeper level than we do today. Evan, I want to circle back to you. You raised how important journalism is to really helping uh, citizens yeah. understand what their government is doing and the impact of it. Right. Um, there's been such a decline in the number of newspapers and from 20, uh, 2004 to 2010, there was a 31% decline of newspapers in Texas. Um, it's really difficult to keep an operation going in the media these days. You've run a very, very successful one. What do you think is the future of media in Texas? Well, I'll go back further than you did and say I'm old enough to remember when there was a Houston Post and a mm -hmm. Dallas Times Herald mm -hmm. and a San Antonio Light, yeah. when there was an afternoon newspaper in El Paso to go along with the morning paper. That was not that long ago, honestly. Yeah. The number of reporters and the number of newspapers in Texas is far fewer than what a thriving democracy needs. And this is really not about journalism, this is about democracy. One of the problems, I think, in our democracy, and I'm not the only one in journalism who believes this, is we have a lot of low information and no information citizens who either make choices based on no information or don't make choices at all and leave it to a very small number of people to decide for the rest of us how our states run, how our countries run. We want to be part of the solution to that by providing people a reliable, credible source of nonpartisan information. No need to wear the uniform of any team but Texas. That's how we've always rolled for 13 years, is advocate for the idea that more informed Texans make for a better Texas. But the good news is there are people in communities like Austin and all over the state who believe in the value of having a reliable source of news, who are willing to become members or become donors, foundations that support us, and I think what you're going to see, not just in Texas, but and you're already seeing it, honestly, around the country, is that nonprofit news organizations are going to pop up every place alongside the existing for-profit ones, and an ecosystem will develop where we'll have a bunch of different types of ways to get our information. I actually have a lot of hope for the future of journalism based on the innovation over the last decade or more 
in new models coming online to provide the kind of information that all of us need to be more thoughtful and productive citizens. I wish more people in elective office would sit down with the press and tell us the things they think. We have one of the last ones here on stage with us who always says yes when he's asked to be a, a part of those kinds of conversations, but it's rarer than ever these days. I've got a question for you, Sarah, and then we're going to have a lightning round to close out, so get ready. Okay. okay. So, Sarah, uh, as a part of what you're doing as, as leading Texas Lyceum, you're going to West Texas and East Texas. You're going to Longview and Amarillo to talk about the future of those areas. Why did you pick those cities and those regions? You know, when you look at some of the census numbers and those demographic changes, frankly, if you see I-35 as a dividing line between East and West Texas, the story and the trends of what's happening in East and West Texas are the latest chapter of the Texas story and the Texas book. Um, for, in the case of Longview, it's the Texas Lyceum's first trip to that city in our history. And so we've got a director who's there who, you know, I just, you know, who has been great at giving us purview into that. I mean, one of the things I didn't know as a North Texan is, you know, I'd always heard, oh, East Texas, where we get our water, it's water rich. Well, again, in the views of not North Texas, but there are water supplies all over the state, which is another issue we didn't even talk about yet. But the future of the water supply in Texas should concern at least a quarter of the room right now. Uh, but not to defer to that, but Longview is a part of that story. They're also in a city like Longview, you saw in the latest census numbers, their white population decreased by almost 13%, right? But in the same time, their population is now more diverse. And so when you learn, and as we are looking into that city and get ready for that conference, that they're starting to deal with issues like mental health and homelessness, issues that maybe cities like Dallas have been dealing with for a long time. When you go west, when you go to Amarillo, if anyone spent time uh, there, I mean, that's a city, one of my first visits to Amarillo, I was shocked by the fact I didn't see a Bank of America anywhere. Did anyone else who's been to Amarillo notice that? There's a reason, because they've got pretty much only local banks that are quite prominent in that community. In addition to that, you saw in the rural parts of Amarillo, the latest census number show population decline, but in the, the urban area, the inner city of Amarillo, you're seeing population increases. And so with that, you're seeing a lot of economic development going into Amarillo. And so I think, you know, for us, you know, Lyceum, an organization that looks to provide a nonpartisan forum to discuss these issues and trends in Texas, it was ripe for us to have this discussion as it relates to looking at the future of Texas. And, you know, we've got our public conference next week in Frisco, one of the fastest growing cities in this country. If you look, if anyone's listened to the latest Freakonomics podcast about why is everyone moving to Dallas, Frisco, McKinney, Plano, they're all a part of that story. And as you look out in the next 10 years, a lot of the stuff that we're talking about will impact these, the Texas Triangle as they call it, but these urban areas in our great state. Okay, so here's the lightning round. So I'm gonna ask you to tell me, we've talked about a lot of challenges here that the, the, the state faces. I'd like to, you to take about 30 seconds to tell me what you think is the biggest challenge facing the state but what makes you the most optimistic? So, Glenn, I'm gonna start with you first. Okay. Hope you don't mind. No, I don't, I don't mind at all. Mm -hmm. I think one, I'll start with first, one of the things that kind of concerns me, worries me the most in part is with the advent of social media today, you know, how that drives public policy and how that drives engagement mm -hmm. in that public policy. Uh, those on social media and I follow and I post some things, but it's a lot of it is emotionally driven, and that doesn't bring in kind of the logical, reasonable, collaborative discussion. So that, that's one concern. Where does that take us as a state and as a country ultimately? But part of the also concern as I'm looking out is with the rapid growth that we have in the state that brings significant challenges. And one of those challenges is affordability of home ownership and affordability to live in this state. And so that's something that I think in the out years as we get further, and we see that here in Austin, we see that to some degree in the Metroplex, but I think that's a real issue that, that we were gonna have to contend with and figure it out. Uh, other states have been ahead of that on before mm -hmm. of us, and so that's one thing. What, what gives me optimism is people wanna be in Texas. I mean, it's a great place, you know, and, and, and that gives me a lot of hope and pride as somebody's family's been here for a long time, is people want to come and join. So, you know, we have to meet some of these very challenging issues that we've talked about 
if we're going to be able to continue to be that economic opportunity, not just tomorrow, next year, the year after, but literally decades from now. I think the greatest challenge is uh, figuring out how do we provide a great quality public education to every single student uh, that's focused on the kind of skills that we need in order to grow. And so that's uh, the digital skills, the math, the communication skills in particular, and uh, solving the underlying issues to be able to get to the point where we have that quality public education for every single student I think is essential to, to our growth as a state. Uh, what makes me optimistic is that having lived in numerous other parts of the country, Texas is the most welcoming, the hardest working, and the most positive spirited place that I've ever, ever seen. And I think that gives us the culture mm -hmm. that's required for us to continue to attract folks like you're describing and also to keep, uh, keep on winning like we are. Mm -hmm. Going back to the, the disappearance of, of newspapers and places that served for so long as the public square, where people came together, no matter where you lived, no matter who you were, no matter what you thought, to litigate their differences in a civil way. My biggest concern is that we've stopped listening to and stopped talking to people we disagree with. We've exiled ourselves into these cocoons of self-affirmation. You know, you can go a day or a week or a lifetime without encountering somebody who has a different point of view than the one you already have, and I don't think that many in the media are helping that. We're like in the United States of confirmation bias, mm -hmm. right? Right. <laughs> the, the, I, I believe that the biggest threat to our democracy is that we're no longer talking to people we disagree with, and so we're just hardening these differences. And again, here's a place where I think journalism can be and needs to be better at being part of the solution. Um, I have the good fortune to teach at the LBJ School at the University of Texas. I have wonderful students um, every spring. Uh, we have an opportunity at the Texas Tribune to have a great number of students from this university and others come and work for us, and we try to teach them how to do this work the right way. And I have a 25-year-old and a 21-year-old in my house. Not actually in my house, but you know <laughs> what I mean. My hope for the future is they're going to fix all the stuff that we've broken. The young people who I talk to on a regular basis make me hopeful for the future because they think many of the fights that we spend our time consumed by are frankly ridiculous. Fighting about that. Why can't we get past that? And so I'm placing my bet on the next generation, many of you in this room, to fix the world that we've screwed up, my generation. <laughs> Thank you, and Sarah. Um, yeah, and picking up from Evan, as part of that next generation, as a millennial, um, I would say, you know, what does keep me up at night and what makes me worried is the idea that we had during the pandemic, which now we're all out, it's great to see so many faces, but we went through, we all saw the murder of George Floyd on television. And for many organizations, institutions, which Evan's already talked about, we haven't really even delved into the fourth estate and institutions and how they keep our democracy together. And what we saw during that period was literally people turning inward. I, I can't tell you how many text messages and phone calls I got from my white friends who just wanted to check in or who remembered a comment I made years ago when I said I felt a microaggression or that something wasn't right. And I think it's that relational piece that we started making progress. I think institutions started creating DEI councils and DEI uh, leads, but to be frank, we didn't finish the cycle. Like we sort of started and then everybody got back to life. And so that piece that he's talking about, the social piece about getting to know people, we gotta finish that. And I think as we look at a more diverse state, we look at a more diverse nation, we've got to finish the work. And as I believe, you know, Controller Hager said earlier, it's hard work. Like, people don't want to have to look inward. People really, you know, partnerships are great, but in order to partner with people, you've got to be honest. You've got to be real about who you are, and that's hard work. And so, for me, that is probably the, 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 the part I want to be optimistic about, but I'm quite frankly realistic about that I know it's going to take some time. What makes me optimistic, though, about our great state is we're Texas. I mean, one of the things that we didn't say bluntly is Texas was really the only state that saw a population increase. We got two seats in Congress. Some people lost seats. Texas is booming. People want to live here, and that's exciting. And so I think for me, that, op that makes me optimistic that we have more new people coming in with that, more businesses, more cultural experiences, and all the things that make a society rich. But what I do hope we can be realistic about and hopefully do hard work about is just being better for each other so that the younger generation, many of you in this room, we do have a future that looks different than the past and we can build that bridge and do it with everybody um, in all generations. Thank you, thank you all. Uh, didn't I say it was a dream team panel? I mean, you're all fantastic, thank you so much.
I appreciate it.